Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mukua, Mukua Manyara. I'll be moderating this session alongside my team. He is our panelist, Mr. Obegi, Eli, Mr. Proshongoza Mujunya, Mr. Osaku Samuel, and Mr. William Kim. This, uh, this brief uh, webinar on tax is titled Tax Developments in East Africa, the 2023 budget cycle, primarily borrowed from the finance team of Kenya 2023, alongside the finance, the Renal Finance Act of Uganda that was passed on the 25th of May 2023. The panelists are experts in their respect, in their, their respect fields, particularly in the practice of tax law, having been uh, expected both from the government side and from the private sector. And therefore, we this webinar intends to get insight from the tax man perspective as well as from the taxpayer uh, perspective. Without further ado, I would go first and go and introduce the a brief profile of the panelist. Mr. Eli Obegi is a senior associate of Oraro and Company Advocate. Is a tax expert. <clears throat> I'm informed that I'm not very audible, so you can interject me if you, at, at any moment that you think I'm not audible. But I'll try to be audible. Mr. Obegi has also worked in other companies and other firms where he has found his skills in uh, tax and this dispute resolution. We also have Mr. William Otien, who is also an employee of, of Oraro Company Advocate, also an expert in ADR, tax dispute resolution. Mr. Rushongoza de Gumia from Uganda is a renowned tax dispute resolution lawyer practicing at First Lab Advocates. Alongside also Mr. Oseko Samuel is a litigation officer and legal service, legal litigation officer, legal services and board affairs in the Department of Uganda Revenue Authority. These are these members are your esteemed panelists for the day. And my co-moderator is Ms. Nyakanini Mwaniki, who is the managing partner at Fresh and Company Advocates just in Nairobi. And, and without much further ado, I invite uh, the speakers to give us a brief view, the view that they hold regarding the two bills as they are now the Uganda Finance Act 2023 and the Kenya Finance Act 2023, and how it's likely to affect the respective economies and the, and the United Economy in East Africa, in East Africa region. In just for one minute. One minute, we will start with Mr. Eli Obegi. Mr. Mokwa, I would ask you to just repeat your question kindly. My apologies if I was not audible enough. Uh, my question is just to have an introductory view on the, uh, your view on the two, like the Finance Act of Uganda and the Finance Bill of Kenya, and how it is likely to affect the economy of both countries and the economy. Um, so if I had you right, you would just like us to give a brief uh, introductory view of what is going on with the, the finance bill in, in Kenya and the tax amendment bill in Uganda. Yes. Uh, so the, the, these two bills um, that are, uh, the Kenyan one is currently undergoing public participation, is due to become law soon. I understand um, the Ugandan bill passed just yesterday. We will hear more about this from Oseko and Megumia, but they, they have somewhat similar provisions. Um, they represent efforts by both the government of Kenya 
and uh, the government of Uganda to first of all expand the, the tax base um, outside of the traditional key drivers of the economy um, where tax, tax uh, collection of taxes has been focused in the past. Um, here we are talking about uh, improving tax collections from uh, let's say digital services, for example. Um, there are also uh, attempts to, 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 to kind of uh, tweak um, applications of VAT and capital gains tax to attempt to expand the, the tax base. There are also some key changes in tax administration, both in Kenya and Uganda, to attempt to make the tax administration, tax collection, tax dispute resolution processes somewhat smoother and more, more efficient. So this is another area that we have seen um, a focus being placed on uh, by both the uh, Kenya and Ugandan governments. Um, there's also um, some uh, proposed changes uh, around um, exchange of information between revenue authorities in different countries and uh, multilateral legal instruments that the respective governments have entered into. Um, and this, of course, uh, rotates around how, let's say, the Uganda Revenue Authority can assist a revenue authority from another state in enforcing and collecting its taxes. Um, there are also, you know, the myriad changes in tax rates that occur at every budget cycle, to varying degrees, both in uh, in Kenya and Uganda. So that is a, a brief one minute or so overview. Um, but the, the 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 key goal for both governments seems to be expanding the expanding the tax base and uh, improving on revenue collection through various legislative measures. Thank you, thank you, Benny. Thank you, Rosalola, and women, and give your brief views on the two bills and acts. Thank you, Mr. Mokua. <clears throat> um, I'm reminded that my video is not on. Um, uh, I think I join issue with the, my brother Obegi. Um, the position in Uganda is not much different uh, with review with respect to the um, amendment uh, bills, which are now the amendment acts. The um, unlike Kenya, which almost ha essentially has its legislation in one block, um, finance legislation. In Uganda, we have uh, various acts that uh, deal with various heads of tax. So yesterday, um, the Income Tax Amendment Act, the Value Added Tax Amendment Act, the Excise Duty Amendment Act, um, as well as the Tax Procedures Code Amendment Act were passed and are now before the president for assent. Um, is uh, essentially the proposed the proposed amendments which are now up for assent uh, aim at expanding the tax base in as far as levying of um, VAT on um, providers of electronic services that are not resident in Uganda. They also aim at uh, encouraging compliance by waiving of taxes and penalties for all outstanding tax that's paid before the 31st of December 2023. They also make modifications to various um, tax deductions that had been available, notable of which they remove the um, initial allowance that had been an incentive given uh, to uh, investors in Uganda aimed aim at encouraging the, the uh, establishment of assets, business assets out of a 50 kilometer radius of Kampala. Now that incentive has been removed, but they also aim at, um, at uh, making modifications to Ugandan tax ad administration, key of which is because um, the VAT Act now provides for um, payment of tax by non-resident uh, entities, uh, in, v in respect of VAT uh, of non-resident entities in Uganda providing uh, electronic services that are vertebral, they now provide for the filing of tax returns in US dollars as opposed to the um, conventional 
UGX. Um, they also now bar um, the letter provision of information in tax dispute resolution processes that was not was not uh, provided by the taxpayer once when it was previously requested for. Um, among a few other modifications, which I think we shall dive into, but um, essentially they aim at expanding the tax base while also um, streamlining and improving tax administration and tax collection. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, thank you for the very, very informed uh, submission. Now, Mr. Oxeku, maybe you can go next before we finish. Yeah. Oxeku, give us your thoughts. Um, thank you very much, um, Ellie. Uh, now, as my brother has elaborated the food, ideally the amendments to the income tax to the various tax regimes in Uganda is essentially looking at uh, widening the tax base and also streamlining tax administration. However, uh, of interest again in the Ugandan area is where well, we, we shall see amendments to the Exercise Duty Act. Uh, for instance, where we are looking at where the intention is really to protect local manufacturers from uh, foreign, uh, foreign from imported products, whereby we are seeing that goods that are locally produced, the duty charged charge on such goods has been uh, substantially reduced. And then also key importance, we shall look at the various amendments to the Tax Procedure Code Act, where the amendments seek to penalize a number of actions. Uh, for instance, issues to do with tampering of uh, tampering of, 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 um, of stamps, uh, issues of um, basically, uh, as we see in the as we will see uh, in, in a discussion, the issues to do with the uh, fixation of wrong stamps on various products that are not authenticated. Uh, those are issues we shall be able to, to dig deep into. And then we shall also look at areas whereby there are, there are proposals to waive interest and penalties uh, where a taxpayer is agreeable or pays the principal sum. Uh, this is an amendment that we believe will be one that will revive Is an interest, I think, is a welcome provision that we shall see uh, helping businessmen to tap into the same, ensure that uh, they stay afloat in their business avenues. But uh, to summarize it up, I can say the amendments are basically looking at how do we support local manufacturers in the Ugandan economy, and secondly, how do we streamline and try to ensure that tax administration in Uganda is efficient. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Oseko, for that. Maybe then we can have Mr. William have his minutes to, to give an overview. Thank you so much. Uh, most of the bulk of what we'll be discussing have been highlighted by uh, my senior, Elio Begi. Uh, apart from the issues which we have highlighted, uh, there are also additional issue on the issue of capital gain tax uh, by bank where they're imposing power of sale. Uh, we'll also have to hear how this one is imposed uh, in Uganda. I think that's one will be shared with my brother, learned brother, Rishogaza. And then we also be talking about the issue of the deposit. And we see how that's spread in Uganda too, the deposit before you appeal uh, any tax decision or any political decision. And we will also be discussing about the levy at the house fund, the 3%. We see what's the issue and how is it also in other countries. And lastly, we also be talking about the amnesty. Uh, the power which was uh, the commissioner have been having to withdraw 
or to waive or to allow waiver application and how the proposed amendment have been made to withdraw or to eradicate such power and the newly introduced am uh, amnesty uh, discretion and its effects. So in, in a nutshell, that's what we'll be discussing. All right, thank you so much, panelist, for that overview. Now that we're done with that, I think we can get to the substantive questioning. But in the meantime, for those who have attended online, feel welcome and please feel free to post your question in the Q&A section. We are going to answer your question at the end of the discussion. So now we can start with the first question. Let's start with the taxation in the digital economy. It seems that both Kenya and Uganda have taken steps in trying to tax the digital, that is the content creators and everything. So uh, if I could ask you, Mr. Obegi, can you at least tell us the challenges that might come up with the taxing of such digital economy? Um, I, I think I would like to hand this over to Mr. Oseku, being that he works with the Revenue Authority, he would be best placed to explain the challenges that they that, that is all right. Thank you. the economy, and uh, the, which is the basis of why this this focus on tax, taxing that sector of the economy has come in in this finance space. All right, then, Mr. Oseku, you can take it over. Uh, thank you, Monique and Ellie. Uh, for the record, uh, my views do not represent the views of URN. So, <laughs> in case my bosses are uh, logged in. <laughs> uh, so, if we are looking at uh, the challenges of uh, tax in the digital economy, uh, one, we appreciate the uh, overview and the interest of the revenue authority in trying to widen the tax base to tap into areas like the digital economy, because this is a new emerging area that really has not been tapped into for a very long time. But as we may know, technology has become uh, an important and a direct facet of our lives in, across the globe. So of course, that also means that the taxman uh, gains interest because if people are making money off it, that means taxman sees an opportunity to wait in tax space. However, uh, some of the challenges that we look in, that we can foresee, uh, we can wonder and look at instances now by how the revenue authorities be able to implement uh, the proposed amendments to the law on uh, taxing a digital economy. Because uh, at what point, how do we, how would the revenue authorities be able to monitor at what point the transactions are taking place? Secondly, we could also ask ourselves, what does that mean to the consumer who is consuming the final product? Because as we may know, whereby the tax in big economy definitely uh, the burden is, is shifted into the final consumer because that automatically distorts the options that someone has to enjoy the services that are being offered over the various apps. And then another key issue to look at for instance, we are seeing a situation whereby if a service is to be offered, for instance, physically, maybe someone is accessing education or online, online services that would do with education. Ideally, if it's a free, if it's a physical service where someone is interfacing with someone directly, such a service, ideally, it would be uh, it would be something that can easily be monitored in case such an entity has uh, registered as a business. But in a situation whereby we are having so many people doing various activities online, whereby uh, some of these, of course, the issues also do with VPNs, where people try to circumvent the access to these online digital services. For instance, Facebook, when the Ugandan government a while ago uh, blocked access to Facebook, we saw so many people resulting to use of VPNs to try and circumvent payment of uh, the taxes that had been levied at that point. So a key issue we need to look at is um, how will be, how the revenue authorities be able to enforce these amendments? Is it, can they do that in an efficient mode? 
uh, where we are seeing uh, maximum utilization of the taxpayers' money in trying to raise more revenue for the government. Um, these are again uh, issues that implementation that we look forward to see if the same shall be and how the same shall be handled by the various revenue authorities. Um, another issue will be what, what is the impact to you as a consumer of who is consuming a digital service? Definitely, for instance, you're using a service like um, uh, Netflix. For the consumer, you expect a scenario whereby access such a service is going to increase because you're the one who is supposed to be, if you're a taxable person, you're supposed to uh, the authority, and even then you're supposed to withhold in, in such payments, such an entity. So as a consumer, all consumers, they need to be aware that this could easily We seem to be losing you, Mr. Oseko. Is consuming the product. Uh, how is how is it now? Monique, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was saying, yeah, I was saying that as a consumer, you should expect that uh, the consumer power of the various people in the various uh, across the East African region is going to be affected a little bit whereby there will be distortion now when it comes to issues of uh, consumer choice, where you want to consume a product, but because of the prices that have been inflated due to the taxes that have been slapped on such a commodity or uh, such a digital service, people will definitely face issues to do with consumption of such a product. However, at the end of the day, as I said at the start, we wait and see how the revenue authority of Uganda, for instance, be able to implement the amendments in a in a more elaborative way and a more a more fair fair way. Uh, so I think those are some of the two challenges that I could see with the new amendment. Uh, I don't know if my brother Rushangoza could have some challenges he foresees with the new amendments to do with digitalization of the economy, taxing of the digital economy in Uganda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Seku. Maybe to, to avoid the disrupting the flow of the moderation, I'll just say one thing. The, the key challenge that for me I now see is the Ivat Amendment Act has now said um, that if you are, among other things, a provider of um, <clears throat> electronic services within the meaning of the Act, and you supply that service to a person in Uganda that's not either VAT liable or v, that is VAT exempt, then you are supposed to account for VAT. Now, the, the conventional position of the law is that where we're dealing with an import of services in Uganda that is vatable, that is uh, subject to VAT, the person who is procuring the service is the one that accounts for VAT. Now, um, of course, uh, I think the taxpayer, the, 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 the policymakers consider the situation where a person who is not supposed to be registered for VAT or is exempt from VAT would now have to account. So they say, no, let the provider of the service do it. Now, the challenge you have is if I am Netflix, if I am um, Uber, or maybe Uber is actually uh, present here, but if I'm any of these businesses, I can simply say, I'm not going to provide my service to anyone that's not VAT registered. Now, all of a sudden, you are likely to have a situation where people who are not intended to account for VAT are brought within the application of the VAT law. By, because also the, the Ugandan law is that for those who are not um, uh, required to register and therefore account for VAT, they could voluntarily register. So you have a situation where people might have to become VAT persons for purposes of accessing these services, some of which have become an indispensable part of life. Now, that of course is a challenge, but it's even more a challenge because that means effectively the prices of all these things are going to be marked up maybe 18% because now there is, there is, there is a, a clearly expressed tax which the corporation that provides that service will likely push onto Ugandan consumers. So my view of the situation had been, and we made these proposals when um, 
these amendment bills were still on the floor of parliament. They said, you, if you're going to deal with taxation of the digital economy, either from a VAT perspective or an income tax perspective, you be guided by the OECD guidelines. Because the OECD guidelines on the taxation of the digital economy are very clear and they provide very elaborate guidelines on how to tax the digital economy while achieving the best um, utility or while uh, using the most efficient means. And I think that is likely going to be a key, key issue in sort of figuring out how um, these, uh, the, the, this VAT on these electronic services especially is uh, collected uh, or is accounted for. So that would be a huge, huge challenge. And, and I think we'll wait to see um, how that, if that, that's assented, how that goes. All right, thank you so much for that. Now, just a follow-up question. Now, with all the challenges that seem to be coming up, do we really need special taxes and rules for digital economy, in your own opinions? Because I understand you do not want to take opinions of the tax. Uh, so maybe we, sorry, I wanted to, all right, proceed. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Um, yes, as a, as a patriot and uh, as a taxpayer, I think the amendments are welcome because you see uh, taxes benefit each and every one of us. So uh, the, the digital economy is, uh, is booming and there's a lot of money moving in the economy. I think it is just in the interest of every Ugandan and every Kenyan or every person across the East African region that the, the state taxes are, are welcomed and duly paid, because at the end of the day, uh, just as we are here, we, we need these taxes to do, to facilitate and enable the governments run and carry out the various activities. However, like I was saying at the start, we really hope and look forward to the fact that uh, we wish and hope that the, that, uh, the taxes will be collected in an, in an efficient mode, because we want to see uh, the maximization of this of the taxpayers' money being put to use at the end of the day when the same is collected. So we wait and see how the revenue authorities are going to put in place various mechanisms to ensure that actually the taxpayer gets value for their money that they're paying to the tax authorities. But at the end of the day, I say that yes, the amendments are really welcome and they're inevitable. All right, then maybe we can proceed to the next question. Mr. Obegi, if you can do it on the Kenyan side, can you kindly let us know what development there have been in this sector in Kenya? And maybe then, but Begiuma can take it on the Ugandan perspective after you're done. Um, so on the Kenyan side, um, the, the, the similar challenges facing taxation of the di digital economy have been uh, have been witnessed, and this has necessitated um, some changes in Kenyan tax laws to specifically provide for taxing digital services and goods that are exchanged over the digital economy. Um, sometime in 2020, Kenya introduced a digital services tax. Um, so this is a tax that is a levied on services that are offered digitally to Kenyan consumers. I think uh, services like Netflix and other similar subscriptions. Um, so the, 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 the tax itself is operates as 1.5% of the transaction value. And uh, it is required to be deducted by the platform owner. That is, for example, Netflix it, itself will deduct that tax and remit it to the Kenya Revenue Authority. So this has been operating since 2020. We have also had um, VAT on digital services, uh, which uh, has been in operation. Um, again, just to bring specifically bring in digital services into the tax bracket. So with the finance bill of 20, 2023, we are seeing a more concerted effort to bring in additional areas of the digital economy into the tax bracket. Um, one proposal that has been put forward is uh, something that is referred to as the digital asset tax. This is a tax that is uh, introduced under the income tax regime. So it's 
essentially a tax on income. The proposal is whenever anybody is uh, selling or disposing of a digital asset, and uh, you know, digital assets here have a wide definition. Uh, they, they are defined as anything of value that is not tangible. So you can imagine the breadth of such a definition might capture almost anything that is not tangible. But uh, some specific um, examples are provided. We are looking at things like cryptocurrencies, uh, want to tax to the token codes, um, non-fungible to tokens, NFTs. Um, yeah, and so basically anything, uh, any asset of value that you can transfer from one person to another over the internet, over a, a digital platform uh, for some consideration. So all that will be brought in to the catch all of the digital asset tax. So how it is proposed to operate, um, once again, it will be the, the, the collection burden will be on the platform that is facilitating the transfer of the assets. If we are transferring cryptocurrency, uh, the owner of the cryptocurrency platform or network has the obligation on every sale I make, um, they will come in and I believe the rate is at 3%. They will deduct 3% of that, of that sale and uh, remit that to KRA. Um, in terms of what we expect from its operation, I mean, obviously it will make, it will make, um, this is going to make uh, Kenya resident persons who are trading in these assets to be forced to mark up the assets, of course, so that they can uh, remain at par in economic terms. So they will have to make up for the 2% somewhere. Most likely they're going to add a markup on the cost of the asset. But then we are forgetting that, you know, these assets, uh, that, that might not be economical in the long run, because if, um, if, if the market knows that this person in Kenya is going to be 3% more expensive because he's trying to cater for this tax, then they would rather purchase that digital asset from somebody in another jurisdiction who is not required to have this markup on his, uh, on, on his, on his assets. So that will discourage you know, the market for Kenya resident persons who are trading in the digital assets. Another challenge, of course, um, you know, depending on other market dynamics, the platforms themselves might be inclined to discriminate against um, to discriminate against Kenyan resident users. Why is this? Um, if Tanzania does not have a digital asset tax, whoever is operating that platform has no tax obligations and administrative obligations when dealing with the Tanzanian. The Tanzanian will trade his assets, make his profits, the platform will probably take a percentage and that's that. But whenever you're dealing with a Kenya resident person on the platform, suddenly the platform has this obligation, deduct this money, pay this money to KRA. Part of this means you need to register for tax in KRA. Um, they are provided for a simplified uh, registration mechanism, that's true, but still it is a burden on the owner of such a platform. So there will be some difficult questions around you know, the, effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness of this. If, if you're going to apply digital asset tax on cryptocurrency, how is the platform owner supposed to know that this user who is disposing of his cryptocurrency asset is Kenyan resident? How, how do you know? It might be difficult in, in, in some circumstances um, to actually know who is Kenya resident and who is not. Therefore, which transaction should I deduct digital asset tax? Which one should I not? Um, again, on the part of uh, the Kenya resident person now um, who is disposing of his assets, um, there's also, we foresee a challenge there. Um, this is not really um, a challenge with the digital asset tax per se, but a challenge of the drafting of the law. There's some ambiguity, some lack of clarity, which the feeling is could cause some sort of double taxation. Because when he's disposing of his assets, 
3% is deducted on the gross amount. Um, later on, he will, at the end of the year, he'll have to file a return, just like the rest of us. He'll have to pay taxes. The taxes he's paying, um, he will have to pay you know, taxes on the profit that he made on the sale of that digital asset. So if, if, if the drafting is not clarified or uh, you know, that ambiguity is not removed, it might result in elements of double taxation. Um, separate from digital asset tax, there's been also an interesting provision, which is to introduce a new um, withholding tax on digital content. So here you will remember uh, Oseku talked about the challenge of revenue authorities uh, with, with, with bringing people in the digital space into the tax bracket. You know, people who um, earn, earn, earn their income in the physical, physical economy, so to speak, um, the revenue authority has ways of finding out that this person has earned an income. If you are employed, for example, um, those pay requirements, your employer will deduct something, will send that to the revenue authority. So the revenue authority will be aware that um, this person has earned some money on, on that transaction. And so the revenue authority has been facing a challenge for uh, digital content creators and players in that space, because most of the time I will, I will create some content for somebody somebody will pay me for the content I've made, it will probably be, the payment will be made electronically, the revenue authority might never know that this individual seated somewhere has made some income which he should pay tax on. So in a bid to, to close this gap, they want to introduce this withholding tax on uh, monetized digital content. So anytime somebody is paying someone else for digital content, the payer, of, 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 of the, the one who is paying for the content is required to withhold withholding 15% of that payment and remit that to KRA as withholding tax. Um, maybe to- Maybe, maybe we interrupt you a bit on that, on that point. Yes, sir. Am I, am I audible enough now? Yes. Okay, if I may interrupt on, on that part of withholding tax on digital content creators. What is your view? I meant to understand from my limited knowledge of tax law is that, that withholding tax for, for fees payable to other professionals is 5%. Uh, and then it is also capped at a, a, a figure of above 24,000 shillings. In fact, th those are important points you raise and I was coming to that. In fact, okay. I want to give you a practical example of, of how this tax would, uh, would operate for us to see some of the challenges that we foresee with it. Um, first of all, it's of course, there is a definitional issue. The definition of digital content is also very, very broad. Uh, it provides that any, any content you provide over the internet or on over any other digital med medium, whether for entertainment, whether educational, you know, whether it is uh, you know, news, magazine, periodical, et cetera, all qualifies as digital content. So a good example of such a transaction will be when you're purchasing an electronic copy of a newspaper. Uh, if you are paying a subscription for, an, for the e-Daily Nation or the e-Standard, um, you let's say the subscription is 50 shillings for a copy of the newspaper. What this provision means is that for each uh, electronic copy of the newspaper you purchase, so today I want to subscribe, on that 50 shillings, I need to withhold 15% of it, that's 7.5 shillings. So I need to withhold that 7.5 shillings, go on ITAX, file a tax return, declare 7.5 shillings, pay it to KRA, possibly by M-Pesa or maybe a bank transaction, and then, all I will be giving the newspaper seller will be the balance, 50 less 7.5%. So obviously you can see there's a challenge there, being that if I'm buying an electronic newspaper every day, the compliance burden is quite high. Every single day I have to go on ITAX, file a return and make a payment. Uh, the same applies if you're buying you know, an electronic copy of music, 
a video, you are subscribing to a WhatsApp or Telegram channel. So overall, it's a, it's a huge compliance burden that I, I personally don't believe that was the intention. I believe the intention was more to capture this kind of endorsement-like transactions where an artist is paid, let's say, 100,000 shillings to endorse a product uh, and not such small, low-value daily transactions. So th this brings us to Mokua's point, you know, how do we start a fixed challenge? You do that by adopting the practice that has been there for withholding tax on professional fees. Many of us are lawyers, we understand taxes withheld on our legal fees, uh, 5%, but it's only withheld when the fees exceed 24,000. So whenever you're earning, you know, small fees, if somebody pays you legal fees of 1,000 shillings to draw an affidavit, there's no withholding. So that threshold of 24,000 saves us from a lot of the compliance burden. Um, so I think it would be a good idea to adopt uh, something similar, such a similar threshold. Uh, we have proposed that to Parliament, let us hope they would adopt it. Of course, another big challenge that is facing uh, players in the digital economy, digital creatives, is of course the rate itself. 15% is high, um, and it may be, may be difficult to, to, to justify the 15%, considering that other professional services are being withheld at 5%. So those are a few challenges we are seeing, but uh, you know the proposal is there. Um, KRA is being uh, you know more and more creative in ways to bring in uh, all these players in the digital economy into into the tax uh, into the tax base for them to also contribute you know to uh, revenue raised by the country, which is not necessarily a bad thing so long as such tipping problems are fixed. Because after all, anyone who is making money on the digital space uh, would and should be happy to contribute their fair share of taxes. But how the taxes are being introduced, how they are being, uh, how they are being administered, needs to be thought about carefully to ensure that all we are doing is collecting taxes on income and not making our our local products or uh, you know digital content digital goods digital businesses operating in Kenya we are not making we are not forcing them to mark up their prices be too expensive such that you know we lose that market and people go to other countries to get these services where the tax regime is is is, is fairer thank you Thank you, Abedi. Thank you, thank you very, very, very much for that. Uh, and now we want to invite Mr. Begumia to highlight to us the key controversies that the Finance Act, now to them is the Finance Act, but elicited, that the key controversies elicited by the Finance Act that was passed yesterday, particularly if if it's one of them, there is a requirement or the requirement to pay security. In Kenya, we sometimes we call it security for cost or security to deposit a percentage of the taxes in dispute before challenging a tax dispute assessment. So how, how does it go in Uganda alongside uh, the key controversies that you have? And then maybe probably we'll ask Mr. William to give us an overview of the same in Kenya and how it is proposed in the finance bill 2022. And understanding that it's not, it's not the first time that such a proposal has come to Kenya, you can also expound to us what happened previously and why it didn't succeed and what the current context means. So Mr. Begumia, probably you can kindly guide us on that. Um, uh, Mokuan, I think given that, uh, just a small clarification, this proposal is not coming up in Uganda. It's coming up in Kenya. So I think William can go ahead and explain to us what is being proposed in Kenya. And then Begumia can come afterwards to tell us what's happening in Uganda. 
Uh, that, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, probably, but I would have suggested maybe maybe Mr. Debume would just give us a highlight of the few controversies that they have in the act. Then probably can narrow down to that. Understood. Um, thank you again. <clears throat> um, so, like uh, I I communicated, um, the in Uganda the 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 mode of tax legislation is a little bit uh, uh, tax head specific. So. We have a law <clears throat> for virtually each and every tax head. So um, the amendments that have been made uh, by, by, by parliament, so the income tax amendment bill that deals with income tax has now passed, it's up for a cent. The VAT uh, amendment act has now passed, it's up for a cent. The excise duty amendment act, which deals with excise duty has been passed and is now up for a cent as well as the Tax Procedures Code Act, which deals with mostly tax administration and tax procedure has also been amended. But there are a few key issues that I want to um, highlight. From an income tax perspective, there's been a transformation of taxation of lottery and gaming winnings. Previously, um, they had been taxed by the normal um, world of taxation, which is re their recognition as property income, and then uh, payment of tax at the applicable rate. That has been changed. I think the view is to expand the tax base because most of the um, Ugandan eligible taxpayers are either non-registered or non-compliant. So now they have been modified to um, taxation by way of withholding tax. So they will now be with, uh, taxed at 15% uh, by withholding from the entity that's paying the winnings as opposed to waiting for the person that has won to declare the income and, uh, and pay tax on it. Um, the second thing is uh, that under Ugandan law, there are interest uh, uh, capping uh, rules, which require that as, as well of a deduction, the interest cannot be 30% more of chargeable income, uh, except if you are uh, a bank. The challenge that we've had here is that you know, um, locally, the modes of financial inclusion are like are largely circles, uh, microfinance institutions, those which are essentially um, financial institutions of the of, of rural areas. And because those institutions give out a lot of loans, they have previously been also subject to the same interest capping deductions as us, which is 30%. Now the law has said they will be receive the same tax treatment as banks. So that should really help the um, microfinance and cooperative space in Uganda, especially because these institutions now, are, especially in rural areas, play almost the role of commercial banks. Um, they, um, from a VAT perspective, there has been uh, the introduction of an express um, VAT charging section for electronic payments, VAT on, I, I mean, electronic uh, provision of electronic services, among other things. Previously, the law, the law was sort of general. Um, it did not precisely provide um, for VAT on those transactions. It's important to note that when the tax bills were presented before parliament, there had been a proposal both for VAT on those transactions clearly and for income tax uh, payable by the entity that's um, providing the service, the foreign entity. The proposal for income tax failed, but the proposal for VAT has passed. And the way it will work, as I hinted earlier, is if you're providing a service to an individual who is either exempt from VAT or not li uh, liable to register for VAT, then it is the foreign entity which is best out of Uganda that will um, have an obligation to account for VAT and um, pay for it. So if a Kenyan company uh, provides a streaming service, for instance, to a Ugandan uh, who is not liable to register for VAT, then the Kenyan company must account for VAT to Uganda Revenue Authority and um, pay tax on it. The other thing that um, is perhaps uh, equally important is the, from an income tax perspective, there have been there has been the removal of what we called initial allowance. Now, um, previously, when this uh, benefit had been introduced. The government of Uganda had noticed that there had been a lot of um, industrialization, centralization in, in urban areas. So you have a lot of the people investing in Kampala, 
or Jinja or the major urban areas. So to encourage people to um, invest and set up uh, revenue generating uh, businesses out of the conventional um, developed areas, they have given a benefit that said, if you put a business asset out of a 50 kilometer radius of Kampala, you are entitled to a deduction for tax purposes equivalent to 50% of the cost base of that asset. So if you put up a plant, for instance, in a place like Nakasongola that cost you maybe 100,000 Ugandan shillings, 100 million Ugandan shillings, you'd be entitled to a deduction of 50 million shillings, which means that you're both going to recognize the cost of doing that as a business expense, but also benefit this, enjoy this deduction, which encourages a lot of people to invest out of Kampala. Now that deduction has been withdrawn. So um, it's very, for the taxpayers that were intending on investing to enjoy that benefit, they'll best be advised that it, if the ascent goes on, that benefit will no longer be available. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that um, there's been um, a few modifications to a bunch of items that were previously VAT exempt. <clears throat> and that's important, especially for people that are involved in um, uh, trade across a region. I know that um, provision of uh, diapers from especially Kenya or Tanzania has been a very, very um, booming business because they have been VAT exempt and there's a huge demand here locally. But now that VAT exemption status has been removed. So um, you expect the price of those goods to go up. Equally so, I know that there's been a huge um, skins and hides business between Uganda and Kenya. And to encourage that business, the law had provided that if you provide, uh, if you sell good skins that are made in Uganda, or if you provide even foreign from the foreign source inputs that are um, used to add value to the skins and hides, you will not be liable to VAT. Now that the amendment um, has said that exemption is no longer available. Um, so especially Kenyan businesses that have been providing the inputs that are important for value addition on the Ugandan side would best be advised um, to reconsider their operations or uh, prepare to mark up their price. Um, I think that's those are the major developments from the Ugandan perspective. Um, I, I don't know if my brother Oseko has some from the... Um, tax uh, Procedures Code Act and the Excise Duty Act. Mr. Osako, do you have something to add from the Ugandan side? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rishu and uh, uh Basically, if we are looking at the Tax Procedure Code Act, uh, the new amendments are mainly to let me just turn on my video. Uh, the new the new amendments are, are mainly to regulate uh, the procedures for tax administration and also to streamline the government's agenda of uh, enhancing revenues. So, so we we have an amendment uh, that expressly seek to criminalize uh, tampering of uh, digital digital tax stamps. So where a person tampers with a digital tax stamp, such a person shall be liable to a higher currency point, which has been increased. And then secondly, such a person could also be imprisoned for uh, an imprisonment not exceeding 10 years. If you look at uh, the, the, the prohibitive measures that have been put less by the government of Uganda in the Tax Procedure Code Amendment Act of 2023, they are quite huge, and uh, we see and we see the spirit of the government in trying to curb uh, issues to do with tampering of digital stamps. And then, um, secondly, like I mentioned earlier, is the issue to do with waiver of interest and penalty. Uh, so many businesses could be in a situation where they are choking on uh, on the issue of interest and penalties. For instance, where the principal liability is less than ten billion shillings. Absolutely, the fact that uh, the interests and penalties are also huge in that area. So, if this act is assented into, we shall see a situation whereby, if someone is to pay the principal by thirty first December of this year, such a person will be able to enjoy the wave of interest and penalties. 
I'm very sure that this will be a relief to a lot of businesses in Uganda uh, that will be able to thrive based on that amendment. And then uh, another key uh, introduction by the new amendment is the issue to do with information. Uh, bas basically, uh, initially, when someone, uh, a taxpayer could be allowed to bring new information and objection when they're objecting to an assessment. And then the, usually URA would be in a position to look at that information further and then uh, see if it holds any merit on the end of the taxpayer. However, uh, uh, the new amendment seeks to bar introduction of information uh, at, at either maybe dispute resolution or the subsequent uh, steps after someone has already objected to such an assessment. And then um, another introduction in the Tax Procedure Code Act is uh, uh, the criminalizing of uh, fixing wrong stamps on wrong goods. Uh, that also is key. And uh, this is now for the traders and the businesses men that are involved in, uh, in the various business ventures. Of course, uh, uh, tax stamps and then uh, digital stamps were infamous among us, the various traders and businesses men because the businessmen were saying the tax stamps were increasing the costs of doing business and in the long run uh, affecting the, the profits that these businesses were earning. However, now that the new amendments seek to penalize such actions, I think as a businessman or any trader involved in the vocation of trade, it is in your best interest that you comply with the law. Otherwise, the penalties and uh, sanctions that put in place are quite uh, serious. Uh, basically, I think those are the key areas of uh, interest in the amendment tax procedure code act. Uh, thank you, Okua. Th thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. <coughs> I'll be requesting the panelists to maybe probably for, for the sake of creating time for the Q&A section, we limit our submissions to at, at most three minutes per question so that we we can uh, save on time. Also, I will be requesting panelists to look at the Q&A section to answer the question that uh, may arise that are easy and straightforward to clarify, even as we continue with the oral discussions. And therefore, I will now go next to Mr. William. Mr. William, uh, among the key controversies I have uh, seen in Kenya in the finance bill includes the housing levy that is being taxed by 3%, as well as the need to deposit 20%, and it's 20% of the disputed tax when there is an appeal from the, the, the tax appeals tribunal to the high court. Kindly uh, give your views on the same, and uh, in just three minutes, just give us your views on these two controversial issues before we go to the next question. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. I will highlight what is being currently proposed, and then I'll leave the effects uh, of this proposal to be expounded by my colleague, Eli. So initially, the issue of uh, placing or making a deposit before you appeal uh, to high court, uh, any tax decision from the tax tribunal. It's a perennial issue that has been raised in the 2022 uh, Financial Amendment Act. Uh, there was also a proposal that this was to be made a deposit of 50% before then you go to appeal. Uh, luckily enough, uh, this one was turned down by the parliamentarians and it didn't see the light of the day. Uh, currently, uh, this dragon again has risen and we are now required or the proposal is made that before you then make an appeal, you are then required to deposit 20%. And the intrigues of this is that you are required to deposit 20% you as a tax, uh, taxpayer, but the commission is not required to do so. And also they require you that after depositing this 20% or an equivalent security to that, in case the appeal is determined in your favor, they propose that the commissioner will then refund that amount uh, or credit that amount within uh, 30 days. 
So uh, hopefully that's the whole uh, the whole proposal, what they are currently proposing, and its effects are as uh, Sina will then be discussing or presenting. Uh, thank you, William. So uh, the, 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 the obvious problem that comes in with requiring this deposit um, is of course we we feel the provision is discriminatory. William has already highlighted. Um, uh, me as a taxpayer, um, if I lose at the TAT, it means that uh, I'm supposed to pay some money to KRA. Um, so before I appeal, I have to deposit 20% of that uh, after the, of that tax before I'm allowed the right to appeal. Um, however, where I am asking for a refund and I am successful at the TAT, this means KRA is supposed to pay me some money. It's supposed to refund me that money. The commissioner has the right to appeal without paying anything. So this discriminatory aspect is, is a challenge on the part of taxpayers, um, which is why the, the, there has been you know, a lot of resistance to introducing this, this, this deposit. Another more important point is, you know, the implications on access to justice. Um, putting in a, a blanket 20% without considering the circumstances of individual taxpayers has the potential to mean that for some people, justice is just impossible to access. Um, what do I mean here? Um, you can have, you know, two taxpayers in the exact almost exact same um, circumstance. That is, KRA has given you an assessment of 100 million Kenya shillings. 20% of that is Kenya shillings, 20 million. But one taxpayer is a large multinational. The other taxpayer is Mokua Manyara, an individual. The large multinational has various ways of accessing capital, even even if push comes to shove, they can go get a loan of 20 million and pay the deposit, um, exercise their right of appeal. If they are successful, um, the, the tax assessment will be scrapped. But Mokua Manyara as an individual, asking him to go and raise 20 million before appealing would mean he's in an impossible situation where he might not be able to exercise his right of appeal. So this, this kind of blanket treatment is a key concern. Um, uh, it, 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 what would be preferable is uh, if we permit, um, you know, as has been the case, th those of you who practice um, before the High Court of Kenya, you, you, you are aware under the civil procedure rules when I want to appeal, I will make my application in court. Um, I will get an opportunity to argue how much of a deposit is fair in the circumstances. So sometimes where you are in a position to pay those hundreds of millions, you will come and say a 100 million deposit is fair, I can pay. When it's not possible, when, where all you can raise is 100,000 Kenya shillings, you get the chance to go before a judge, explain your circumstances. The judge will make a reasoned decision based on what you submit. In such a way, every taxpayer, regardless of their financial might or resources, gets to exercise their right of appeal because they get to explain exactly how much of deposit or of security they can provide so that they can proceed with their appeal. And the final big challenge with this is, is unfortunately the challenges we have in East Africa and I think Africa-wide of processing refunds by the tax authority. If the tax authority was very efficient, if they took 30 days to process a refund and give you money, many people would be happy to pay that deposit because they know if I'm successful, the money will be refunded to me within 30 days, within 15 days. And so it will not affect the, the capital of my business, my ability to keep my business as a going concern. But where we have a revenue authority that takes sometimes a year or two years to process a refund, it becomes a challenge. I'll pay a deposit to court today. We will handle the appeal before court for one year. At the end of one year, I'll have been successful. I will ask for my money to be returned. It will take another one year or maybe two to get my money back. In those three years, 
this money could have been crucial in keeping me afloat during tough financial times. But because it was locked up in that entire refund process, it was not available to you. Perhaps you ran out of money and had to shut down your business. So that is the unfortunate part of it. Um, this notwithstanding, I'm aware that uh, a similar uh, deposit requirement exists in Uganda, which Begumia will tell us about shortly um, how it operates. Um, there, there are interesting things to pick up from the Ugandan scenario because the constitutionality of that provision has been challenged, um, I believe, in the Uganda Constitutional Court. And there is a decision on that. I believe it even went on appeal. So it would be interesting to hear the experience on that side. But I mean, just to, just to put in context uh, how challenging this can be, I have been involved in a tax dispute where amounts in disputes, uh, it, there was a huge sum in dispute before the Ugandan, uh, the, the URA had assessed the client. And the amount was so huge that asking them to put in a 30% dispute, the deposit to go to the TAT in Uganda was almost impossible. So the client had to find an alternative way to challenge. And we ended up having to go to the East Africa Court of Justice just to circumvent this huge amount of money that is, has been placed in my way and has made me uh, unable to access the TAT in Uganda. So we are forced to go to the ESCJ in Arusha, which, um, which does not have an, an, an equivalent impediment. Um, of course, this, this was able to, to give the client relief in some respects, but not in all respects, because as you're aware, the orders that the ESCJ can issue are rather limited. Um, so they can declare that whatever tax assessment was issued is illegal, but there are a few challenges around enforcement of that order. And there are some challenges about, yes, they can, they can make the order that the collection of that tax should not have been permitted, but it has already been permitted. That does not automatically grant, grant me a refund of those taxes. So these are the kind of challenges that we foresee should such a deposit be introduced. Um, before I hand over to the Gumia, you had asked us to briefly discuss um, the national housing levy that is proposed to be introduced. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have all, most of you have seen in the media, there is a proposal to amend the Employment Act. So this is not, this is not a tax per se. This is uh, just an amendment to the Employment Act to create a housing fund and a requirement that employers and employees contribute um, 3% of their, of, of their salaries towards the housing fund. Um, these funds are to be administered by the levy and be used to construct affordable housing. Um, and of course, you know, the, the obvious challenge here is this is a levy that is not accompanied by a direct benefit to me as the person who is being required to put up the levy. Um, National uh, Hospital Insurance Fund is able to work because you are collecting a percentage of somebody's salary. In return, you're giving him medical insurance. They can go to the hospital, use that NHIF card, to access um, medical services at a heavily discounted cost. Um, the, the pension funds that usually contribute to, yes, it's a deduction off of my salary, but again, this is not money that's going to the government. That money is purely held by the trustee of the pension fund. He's investing it, he will give it back to me on retirement. So in both cases, we are not, giving a quote-unquote donation to the government. Uh, so the levy is challenging because yes, I'm contributing to that fund, but how many houses are going to be constructed? Will I be able to get a unit of housing? Do I even want a unit of housing? Um, 
I mean, it, it creates all sorts of problems. Um, they have tried to cure this by saying we will hold on to the funds for seven years, and at the end of seven years, you can apply to have it back. But that again is a challenge. Um, and I will I will just approach that from a, an economic point of view. Um, it is not the business of government to decide how I spend my money, how much I should spend on um, my subsistence versus how much I should save. That should be a personal decision on my part to decide how much I should save, should I want to save. Um, and I mean, many people are aware, those of us who want to save, uh, you, can put in, you can put that money into a government bond, a 10-year government bond. And at the end of 10 years, you'll get your money back with whatever, with whatever interest you are earning on it. So that should be left to market forces. You should not come and force me to invest in this fund. You're effectively forcing me to purchase a government bond or to give the government a, a, a loan for them to hold that money for seven years and then give it back to me. I, again, with what interest? When I'm buying an infrastructure bond, a government bond, I'm aware from the outset how much interest I'm going to earn. I'm taking a calculated risk or a calculated investment. With the housing fund, housing levy, I'm not sure what return I will get, if at all I will get a return. So these are the challenges that uh, you know are, are, are making many em employees and employers uh, to ask for that levy to be scrapped, or at the very least to be suspended pending further consultations and a more effective model being set up. And just as a uh, as a um, parting shot, I mean, it, it, it is arguable that that provision is unconstitutional. Why? Because the, 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 the burden of providing housing, that constitutional right to housing, it's not placed on employers and employees. That is a burden on the government of Kenya. The government of Kenya is passing off this burden to employers and employees only. So why should me as an employer subsidize housing for the whole country? Why should me as an employee subsidize housing for the whole country? It is different if you required every single Kenyan to make a contribution. Maybe that would have been arguable. But why are you uh, setting me apart as an employer or an employee? So yeah, with those few remarks, I think I will hand over to Beguma to tell to tell us about the the deposits, uh, the, the, the issue of the deposit before appeal. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ali. Um... Well, the position in Uganda is a little bit different. Um, in under the Ugandan law, maybe that's the, the first thing I should explain, is a tax dispute um, begins by way of a tax decision. So typically an assessment, an advance assessment, and so on and so forth. If a taxpayer is unhappy with uh, that decision, they apply for review of that decision or they object. We call it objecting. And that objection goes before the objections department of URA. That department um, considers the decision that has been made, maybe sometimes a tax assessment, maybe an advance assessment, whatever it is, and decides whether to maintain the decision of the assessing officer or not, who is also an employee of URA. So if URA gives a decision that you are not, not happy with, then you apply for review uh, before the tax appeals tribunal. Now, the position of Ugandan law is that at the point when you apply for review between, um, at the point where you apply for review from the initial decision is when you pay the 30% assessment. Right. So even before it goes to you are to the tax appeals tribunal, that 30% of the taxing dispute is what has to be paid. Um, now, uh, last year, that question went to the Constitutional Court of Uganda. Um, there was an argument that, look, one, when I'm in the middle of a dispute with URA, the Ugandan Revenue Authority, URA, if it owes me money, for instance, there's a refund question. 
URA does not have to deposit anything. But number two, if you ask me to deposit 30% of the tax in dispute, you are limiting my access to justice because sometimes the reason why I'm objecting is because I did not make that amount of money to generate that amount of tax, right? And uh, we had the challenge, Mr. Uh, Seku may not be very happy with me for saying this, but we had the challenge because the URA officers now, what, what they were doing is if they needed to assess you for 100 million shillings, they would assess you for maybe 600 million shillings, so the 30% generates exactly what they had wanted to assess you with in the first place. So um, you find a taxpayer saying, look, you've hit me with an assessment of a billion shillings, which is $900,000. I did not make this money, so there's no 30% in my, in, my in my bank to pay because I did not make the money that you, you're claiming that I made. And, and, and the constitutional court in Uganda said, there are two things. There is where you challenge what we call a quantitative challenge. You challenge the math. You're saying, um, URA assessed me, they claim that I made maybe a billion Ugandan shillings in chargeable income, uh, and therefore I'm supposed to pay tax of 300 million. I'm saying that actually I made maybe 100,000 shillings in chargeable income, therefore the tax I ought to have paid is 30. So you're saying 300 million, I'm saying 30. That's one case. Case number two is where I'm challenging either the validity of the law under which I'm being taxed, or I'm challenging how that law has been interpreted, right? For instance, someone has said um, there is VAT on processed milk. So one person is saying, but you see, the yogurt is not processed milk. It is yogurt, it's no longer milk. Then the person says, but no, the base is milk. So there's a debate on how to interpret the law. Now the court, the constitutional court of Uganda said, where the challenge is an arithmetic computation of what the tax is, then you have to pay the 30%, no questions asked. And their argument was tax is the lifeblood of government and tax dispute resolution processes take a while. So government is not going to wait for you to exhaust all the dispute resolution processes before you pay the tax. Now, um, on the other end, they said, if however the question is the interpretation of the law, then you are not under an obligation to pay 30% because the very essence of the computation is disputed by the interpretation of the law. In my view, I was a little bit unhappy with that decision because the law is imposing a statutory charge of 30% oblivious of the circumstances of the taxpayer, right? In my view, the mechanism of, um, that is provided under the procedural law, laws by security of costs or security for judgment or whatever the case is a more efficient way of calculating because then the taxpayer is allowed to demonstrate what would be the appropriate amount of security to give. Um, it's a very significant challenge because um, under the courts of Uganda have been recognizing Cash flow is a very important business asset, especially for East African businesses, which are often small and are often the basis on which you're going to build the economic growth of these countries. Because uh, for all their benefits, FDI companies or MNCs are, are, not, are never going to transform East Africa. It has to be domestic enterprise to do it. So if you take away the cash flow asset, which is the biggest asset of these businesses, and if you do it in, a, in an environment like in East Africa where credit is extremely expensive, then you undermine the ability of these businesses to survive until the end of the dispute, let alone long term. So our position in, in, in Uganda is, is exactly that. If it's a quantitative dispute, you have to pay 30%. If it is a qualitative dispute, you dis dispute the interpretation of the law, you don't have to pay 30%. All right, thank you so much for that. Now that we're in the corridors of justice, uh, we understand that there is a court case. I would like this to be answered by Mr. Oseko because he seemed to have participated in the case. Uh, there is a court decision that is in press in Uganda and it's touching on taxes, transaction where banks are selling property in enforcing a mortgage. 
Mr. Oseku, could you kindly give us the details of this matter? And then maybe Ellie can come in later and tell us if there are similar issues in Kenya or any other decisions by the courts. Uh, thank you so much, Moniki. Um, the decision that we are talking about is a recent court decision of the High Court of Uganda. Uh, in the names of the World War versus GRA. So basically what transpired briefly was that the uh, World War purchased uh, assets from, uh, the, from a bank. However, it didn't disclose, it didn't withhold, uh, it didn't withhold on the payment it was making with the bank. Uh, a result of which GRA raises an assessment for non withholding of tax. But uh, important to note is the charging section of uh, that withholding tax, which is section uh, 118B2 of the Tax Act, which, uh, if I'm to read it, and it treats a resident person who purchases a business asset shall withhold tax on such a purchase or when they're making such a payment. Uh, it is a very interesting decision that has caused a lot of. Uh, uh, varying opinions from the different people in various, in various sectors, but especially in the legal fraternity and the banking sector. Uh, when the matter came up in the High Court for hearing, basically the question the court was to decide was, what is the character of uh, the proceeds that are coming from a, a sale of an asset by a bank uh, where such an asset had been mortgaged by a borrower? Uh, the High Court is of the, the view of the view that uh, such an asset uh, is merely a mode of uh, the bank trying to recover back its money that it lent to the borrower, and it's not in any way a uh, property of the bank that an, an individual is purchasing. So, if it's not property of the bank, that means the purchaser is not under an obligation to withhold tax on the same. Uh, Again, uh, Maniki, what was your question? You, my, my view about the ruling of the court, uh, it's a hard one, <laughs> uh, but uh, we wait and see what the Uganda Revenue Authority will hope to do in respect of the ruling. But uh, with all due respect, I feel like uh, uh, it's a decision where we need to get an overview of the ruling of the, of the, superior, the most superior court in Uganda. So we get to see what uh, the most superior court will say about the same. Because as a person, I, I feel like uh, the interpretation, the correct interpretation of that provision would be all the treatment of uh, such uh, proceeds that are coming from a bank selling such a property is that the moment, the, at the moment of foreclosure, uh, the interests of the bank crystallize, and at that moment, the property becomes part of the bank. So when someone purchases such an asset from the bank, ideally, they are purchasing an asset that belongs to the bank in totality. So at that, at, to that extent, I, I feel uh, I have my reservations about the decision of uh, the High Court. But like I said, we look forward and see what will the Uganda Revenue Authority decide to to go about the same, would they appeal? Would they be happy with the decision? That is up to them that they will decide. We just look forward to wait and see. Uh, maybe my brother Begumia can also share his thoughts. Of course, personally, he has engaged me. He was he's very happy with the decision of uh, High Court. But again, we look forward and see what the authority decides to do with the same. All right, thank you. And then maybe Mwaniki, I don't know what my brothers from uh, No, I can Kenyan give you Mwaniki because our time is running out, but I can give your counterparts uh, a minute to maybe give his own thoughts about the ruling. Okay, but I would, also love, I would also love to hear from my brothers from uh, Kenya. What do they think of uh, the decision of court? I think they will comment on that when they get the floor in just a Thank minute you. after Thank you, thank you. I think I've thank been given so. a minute. Let me, let me wrap it up. One, I want to say that I was very, very happy with the decision. 
I should have bought myself a bottle of champagne that day, but for other court engagements. <laughs> Listen, the, the, the issue is this, right? Under Ugandan law, if someone sells, under Ugandan, the Income Tax Act, if someone sells a business asset, if a tax resident purchases a business asset, they are liable to withhold from the person they are buying from, right? Under the same Ugandan law, if you make an interest payment to a bank or you repay the principal tax, the principal loan, it is exempt from withholding, right? Those are the two contestations. Now, the question becomes, what happens if the bank, if you fail to repay and the bank forecloses your property and sells it? What Mr. Oseku's group was saying was, if I actually pay without having to foreclose or whatever, I don't have to withhold in accordance with the law. But if the bank sells my property, the bank is selling an asset it owns, and therefore there is a withholding tax. My view is that no. Why? Once, uh, and the court agreed with us, once you go to mortgage an asset, the bank, you are exchanging an unliquid asset for a liquid asset. The unliquid asset is property or a motor vehicle or whatever in exchange for a liquid asset, which is cash. Therefore, the bank now has lost its liquid asset, which is cash, and retained your non-liquid asset, which is, um, which is the, the property. Once it goes back into the market, it is disposing of its unliquid asset to recover capital and interest, which are both exempt under Ugandan law from withholding. So the court was correct because it recognized that the sale in foreclosure is not a sale for itself. It's not a business transaction in that sense. It is a sale to recover capital and um, in interest, which are exempt from withholding tax under Ugandan law and are taxed by the conventional model tax declaration. So I agreed with the court. I've seen some of the Kenyan decisions, I think, have also agreed with our line. Because to apply Mr. Oseku's reasoning would be to introduce a 15% surcharge on a loan. So you're going to make credit even more expensive than it already is. So I, I found the decision brilliant to Mr. Oseku and his people can appeal all the way. We hope the, the Supreme Court agrees with us and uh, Mr. Oseku can then come back and uh, maybe issue an apology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Begumia. I seem to be having issues with pronouncing your name. But thank you so much for the insight. Mr. Eli, you can come in. Maybe you can give a comment about what you think about the Ugandan matter. Then you can maybe give them what has happened in Kenya previously on the same issue. Clearly, they are in, they are in line for a titanic legal battle all the way to the Supreme Court. I'm sure Oseku is not giving this up without a fight. Um, all we can say there is uh, there's a markedly similar issue we had in Kenya around capital gains tax. I think William will take you through that case and what was held. Yeah, yeah uh, I will briefly comment on this and I agree with uh, my learned friend, the Gumia. In Kenyan scenario, uh, our high court has held in Kenyan Bankers Association versus the Kenya Revenue Authority. This is a 2020, uh, 2018 case. And uh, the jurisprudential uh, connotation currently is that capital gain tax is not uh, the duty of the bank to pay whenever they are enforcing a statutory power of sale. And this has been highlighted over, uh, I'll give just roughly two reasons with the court currently, and uh, the court have been repeating, why is it not possible for the bank then to be having obligation to pay capital gain tax in such a scenario? One, I don't agree with Osekus uh, uh, reasoning that once the bank has taken your property, they have now, they have charged their property, then they have, they are now the owner. Because even if we leave the law, you check the scholarly, uh, bundles of rights is that you have to have all bundles of rights for you to be the owner of the property. In this case, you are having a restricted bundle of rights, only maybe of access, and you can't do anything with that land unless you ask the owner who then charge the land. In our law, Section 56 of uh, Land Registration Act, Subsection 4, 
says that whenever you are in a certain transaction of charge, a charge cannot then act as a, a transfer of a property. That means you cannot then gain ownership of a property through a charge. So when the bank is then uh, enforcing the asset power of sale, one of the reasons why they will not be required to pay capital gain tax according to this judgment is that they are not the property owners. The property owner is the person who then took the loan. That's the property owner and that's the person who will be required to pay such. The second reason is there is no gain uh, while the bank is doing such. If there was a loan of 300, they're just trying to recover that loan and the excess in any case is given back to the owner of the land. So there is certainly no gain. And our courts have held that uh, it is so erroneous for the Kenya Revenue Authority to interpret the law in the extent that such circumstances then require the bank to pay capital gain tax on it. So that's the, the position here. And I think it's in tandem with the position uh, my friend Beguma is saying. I don't know how safe you then have to convince go to appeal in, in that. And then I also check the, the law. I don't know if your laws uh, provide that a transfer will happen by a security. If you provide a security, it does, doesn't, doesn't unclothe you on your property right. It only levies the other person uh, bundles of right which are not which are limited per se. All right, thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to add, Mr. Eli? Or we can proceed. No, I think that was very comprehensive. All right, thank you so much. But in that question, it seems Mr. Oseku, your Kenyan counterparts have said you're on your own. So you'll have to figure out a, another way. Now let's go back to the let's go back to now our discussion. There were developments that have been that have been there in taxation of employees in this budget cycle. Mr. Eli, you can give us a point of view on the Kenyan side. And then Mr. Begu, Beguima, Beguima can maybe help us understand the Ugandan perspective. Thank you. So I, I will only talk about two, two things here. One, because it's interesting and brings um, brings out different sets of emotions, depending on who is asked the question. The second one, because there was a similar provision in the Ugandan bill and we can compare what's going on in Kenya and Uganda. So on the first part, Kenya has a, a increased the tax rates for individuals in terms of uh, employees. So the highest payee tax band is, has now increased from 30 to 35. But um, of course, this is affecting incomes of uh, 500,000 shillings for employees. Um, so the reason it, 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 it elicits different emotions, uh, depending on where you fall, for people who fall uh, a lot underneath this 500,000 shilling threshold, which I have to say is a big majority of employed persons. I think the last time, uh, I saw a statistic of, you know, um, among employed people, those earning of 100,000 Kenya shillings per month were only about 70, 80,000 Kenyans out of the many millions of Kenyans we have. So for the bulk of the country that is beneath this, uh, I'm sure they will be in support. Um, the argument is the wealthy should pay a more proportional share of tax than, uh, you know, those who are less to do. Um, there are good reasons for that. Um, but of course, people who are in the 500,000 shillings and above, uh, like Mr. Mokua, uh, are very unhappy about that. Uh, they, they feel uh, they are already being overtaxed. And instead of the Revenue Authority expanding the tax base, bringing people in the informal economy into the tax bracket, they are just adding additional taxes on the part of uh, those who are already heavily taxed. So that is the one development. The second development um, rotates around uh, taxation uh, of, of ESOPs, employee share 
ownership plans. Um, and especially this is a, it's becoming more and more relevant given developments in the digital economy. Many tech startups would, because of obviously are somewhat cash flow strapped, would prefer to remunerate employees in terms of um, giving stake in, in their business. Um, so this has um, this has now um, resulted in some some relooking at the taxation of ESOPs. Kenya is proposing to defer the tax point for the ESOPs for up to five years in some cases. Uh, while this is welcome, we really do not believe it is enough. Uh, firstly, because in the drafting of the of the deferral. It is only in some cases where it is a true deferral. In other cases, it does not operate as a true deferral. This is because you know it depends on the date at which the ESOP vests. It can be granted to you today, but takes three years to vest. So if it vests after three years, and you're telling me that you're deferring the taxation to five years from today, in essence, you're only giving me a deferral of two years, not of the full five. So some better wording would be more useful. But what would be most useful is, I would think, an exemption or possibly a lower rate of tax. That is something that you know would encourage more uptake of ESOPs. And uh, that is something that would uh, you know, um, be, be, be a boon for these startups and encourage them to grow. Why I say an exemption, it's because in any event, Bottom line, this employee is going to sell his shares at the end of the day. A, a sale of shares should ordinarily be subject to capital gains tax based on usual capital gains tax principles. So it really does not make a lot of sense to subject that as of payment to payee when he's receiving it and then later capital gains tax later. So this is a case where an exemption would be fair but it would also not take away the government's taxing rights altogether because they will get something on CGT at the end of the day on the profit when he disposes of that, 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 that share. Um, the Gumia can tell us about uh, what was proposed in Uganda on, on the same. Yes, from the Ugandan perspective, there was only one notable proposal, which was um the exemption of the sale of employee share options um under ugandan law if an employee is given or a class of employees are given um share options and they dispose of them or they dispose of that right the income they get is treated as part of their employment income and therefore taxable now there was a proposal to exempt that income from taxation with the view of enabling um, Ugandans, especially SMEs and uh, startups, to have more remuneration options uh, for the purposes of retaining talent. Um, it was a proposal that uh, for us in private practice had found very, very good and had supported. But uh, unfortunately, when the uh, amendment bills went onto the floor of parliament, that proposal was since deleted. So the position under Ugandan law remains that um, the disposal of uh, employee share options or employee share rights are taxable as part of the employment income, which is a little bit unfortunate. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Maybe then we can, we have so many questions. People have so many questions. We also have questions that we don't want to ask. But uh, maybe we can first go to the Q&A section. Mr. Mukua can lead us through that before we yes, see how much. You. Thank, you. thank you, Precia. First of all, I would want to know this question. I believe, uh, OK, the panelists will choose who will uh, tackle the first question. I think I will mark the Christopher Oyez and Franklin Betts question. Mr. Christopher Oyez asks this. Thank you for your insightful presentations. And for Kenya, what do you think are the long-term implications of the cost of capital for the government pro pro proposal to tax insurance proceeds? This is the same question that I think is replicated by Mr. Franklin Betch. 
and therefore, in two minutes, I, I guess, uh, Mr. William, you can uh, give us your views on that. Oh, um, so uh, thank you. I think I will I, I will deal with this one. Um, thank you, Ayer, uh, and thank you, Beth, for taking the time to be here with us and for your contribution. This is a bit of a controversial amendment. Um, um, applying 16% VAT on insurance proceeds is, is, is quite problematic on a couple of fronts. First of all, from, from a, so to speak, definitional or theoretical perspective of what a value-added tax is. Um, a value-added tax is something that is charged on a supply. So I need to be supplying a service to you or a good to you. And we will apply a 16% charge on that service of good that I'm supplying to you. Um, even in other countries which don't operate VAT per se, they operate a sales tax instead. And you know, a sale operates on a sale. I've sold a good to you. I've sold a service to you, so we tax it. When somebody applies 16% VAT on insurance compensation, the problem becomes, where is the supply? Where is the sale? What, what, what are you supplying here? There's nothing that the insurance company is supplying. You had a perfectly functional asset, and the asset, you know, you had a building, it was, it collapsed beyond repair. The insurance company has given you a sum of money equivalent to the worth of the building. You're going to use that money to just reconstruct the same building that was there. So what exactly is the insurance company supplying to you? Nothing. It is a reimbursement of a loss you have suffered. So really, they should, they should, the, the issue of applying VAT on, on, on such compensation really should not arise. You know, it, it, it's, it's arguable. It's even a, a question of double taxation. Because remember, when you acquired the asset that has now been lost, you it was taxed 16% VAT, was applied on it. When you paid your insurance premiums, 16% VAT was applied on your insurance premiums. You've lost the asset, it's being returned to you. Now somebody wants to apply 16% VAT again. So it's a bit problematic. We are hoping that is something that will be rethought to ensure that you know effectively we are not subjecting uh, insured persons to double jeopardy. Where you've lost your asset, uh, you've gotten it back, sometimes not even all of it, and the government wants 16% of that asset it's still. Um, so yeah, the, that, that would be my answer to that question. Oh, I believe Oyer had a second question on uh, proposals to promote investment in affordable housing. My colleague William can deal with that one. Oh, okay, on the proposal to um, uh, promote the investment on uh, affordable housing, I, I think the government need no, in fact, uh, we had agreed that 3% is not one of the taxes, but now how to make the housing affordable? The government need then to reduce some of the taxes which are being charged probably on the, that increases the cost of constructions high. Uh, recently, before when we were before the parliament, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers are really in a deep cry that the cost, the input cost of constructions is going to probably increase due to the increase in tax and levies in several uh, construction material like cement, metal. And this one then will be a counter uh, reactive, uh, counter -reactive action because if you have increased the cost of construction materials, the end product is that the cost of housing will not then be affordable as intended. So one of the proposals is to reduce these levies on these raw materials and input products so that then at the very end, we then have a lower cost and also affordability of housing in our country. So that is one of the main proposals we can place. And secondly, uh, when the government then have a conjunction or a, a joint cooperation between them and the private sector, PPs, where they then uh, contribute in uh, establishing these buildings, they need then to have 
a variety of exemptions and maybe also tax reliefs. So then, then it reduced the, the end game is to reduce the cost of construction, uh, construction to be a bit low. And then that one in turn then make the housing project and also affordability of such houses to be at reachable cost by the common one. All right. Thank you so I much, Mr. Has William. Been a follow up on the insurance compensation issue from Onesmas, where he's saying you're being compensated because you claimed a credit. While there is a point to it, it's uh, in my view, yes, you got a credit, but you also used that asset to produce taxable goods, which you sold, and output VAT was charged thereon. So the output and the input offset each other. So why should I come and get another 16% of the point? That's my thing. Over to you, Nathalie. All right, thank you so much, Ellie and William. There is a question by Emily or CMO and seems to be specifically directed to Mr. Oseku. Can Olaka, I don't think Olaka, but I hope that that meant Mr. Oseku. He said, do you have similar reservations in the case of Ham Enterprises and another versus DTB Uganda and another? I think you can also be assisted by your counterpart, Mr. Begumia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maliki. Uh, Pardon me, we have similar reservations uh, in relation to the to the Luwalu decision or it seems to be a Ugandan matter. Mm. Uh, she has quoted the case of uh, harm enterprises and another versus DTB Uganda and another, but then she also mm. followed up with the comment thereafter. I hope they are related. She's, she's saying that you kindly comment on the introduction of 16% VAT on petroleum products. Well, that's, that's a separate question um, on the, uh, directed on the Kenyan, Kenyan side, not the Ugandan side. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. But nonetheless, I can, I can, I can briefly try to address it. Um, I mean, uh, that's that's a challenging question to ask. Um, I understand you. I know. Because um, yes, yes, we do not want sixteen percent VAT on petroleum products. Yes, we want the preferential rate of eight percent to remain on uh, petroleum products. Um, but. Um, we also understand where the government is coming from. Uh, the government is under in, immense pressure to standard rate uh, petroleum products, uh, of course, from our lending partners and from its own drive to, to you know, show up the tax revenues that we have mm -hmm. to avoid you know, taking on so much debt. So it, it is challenging. Um, why it is even more challenging is the 8% was a preferential rate um, to cushion uh, Kenyans from tough economic times that you are having at that time. I don't, I, I believe this provision first came in 2013. So it came in as a temporary um, reprieve measure, which was, uh, it, it was just a temporary measure for just one year. It has kept on being extended over and over and over for, I don't know, eight, 10 years now. So it would be a bit difficult to argue against the introduction, the introduction of the 16% VAT, which is long overdue, but also we understand with how the market is, with the cost of fuel, with the, how the exchange rate is, and more so given the fact that, you know, we purchase all our, all our fuel through uh, you know, our foreign exchange reserves, which are an all-time low. So it is very challenging. It's, it, 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 I mean, it is difficult on all angles. Maybe a case can be made for a further, you know, kick the can down the road one more year, uh, perhaps. Um, I don't know. I don't know anything.
Thank you. Thank you, Abegi. Uh, I believe now we can open up the floor. Question from uh, the attendees. We will take, I think, three or four questions. And then the attendees, as you ask your question, maybe kindly you can uh, direct it to a specific panelist for, for proper address of the same. Greg has made me famous today. At one point, he says I'm poor. At another point, he says I'm rich. <laughs> it's a good thing. And therefore, Mr. Elmas, you can uh, you can allow speakers to those who raise who, those who raise their hands can be allowed to speak and uh, address their questions to the targeted panelists. Thank you. I've already allowed Joanna Tim kindly ask your question. Uh, thank you. I've actually gone ahead to type the same on the Q&A, but just to add that, um, I was requesting the, 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 tax, the person from the tax administration to answer this in line of the current statistics. You have a country of over 50 million people. Uh, you have, um, for example, the people who vote uh, in the different countries at probably let's say 14, 19 million, then the tax, the, the, the people within the tax base are, for example, less than 8 million or less than 10, 10 million. Uh, kindly answer on how you plan. I, I know you're passing your own views and not for the tax administration, but how do you plan to widen this tax, uh, this tax base in light of the different proposals? looking to the fact that all the countries are looking to widen the tax base. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, John, for the question. Now, uh, some of the uh, avenues in place to try and increase the tax base in light of the amendments. First and foremost is uh, increasing and enhancing tax education for your Ghana Revenue Authority, for instance. Uh, I don't know if the feedback is coming from my end. Thank you. Uh, for Uganda Revenue Authority, for instance, there's already a drive where they are trying to make sure that uh, uh, URI was able to procure some buses uh, that are moving from district to district in the rural areas to try and educate people about the various tax obligations and the various benefits that accrue to them upon registration and registration for payment of their tax, ta taxes. So tax education is one of the things that the government is really embarking on. And uh, secondly, I think there's also an issue to do with sensitization. That is one of the things that the revenue authority is embarking on to try and uh, put in place as much literature as possible in as many languages as possible ensure that people from the different uh, areas of the country, and I think this also could be applicable to the Kenya Revenue Authority, that if you can put in place as much literature as you can in various languages, given the fact of, given the fact of our unique uh, nature of uh, different languages in different regions, so that when people get to know uh, about the various tax obligations, the various benefits that, that can happen to them once they register Taxable as as um, as taxable persons, I think those are the key avenues that are being looked at to try and tax. It's trying to educate people and trying to move physically to try and educate people from the roots, basically. And of course, also advertising is also one of the things where you will see a lot of adverts running on mainstream media, uh, TVs, newspapers. Um, I've seen the revenue authorities have also become a little bit humorous on, for instance, Twitter, where they're also trying to get on to jump onto the current trends to ensure that they tap into the various uh, opportunities and uh, and, uh, and market uh, various opportunities and uh, I should say congregations where people can learn more about their tax obligations and generally everything to do with uh, uh, taxes. Maybe Mr. Osepo, I can just add one thing, which is within the, the, the amendments that have now passed. Um, the last year, 
an amendment was made to the tax procedures code act that said that a business cannot get a business license unless they had a, a, a taxpayer identification number. The challenge with Uganda is really because with the same as Kenya, it's a compliance, uh, self-compliance based mechanism. A lot of people have not been registered. So now there's a new amendment that says um, that no government agency or uh, local government agency can register an instrument that is subject to stamp duty except if the person submitting that instrument has a taxpayer identification number. What that basically does is because one of the biggest modes of transaction in the economy is purchase of property, which is subject to uh, the change of registration of which is subject to stamp duty, is now basically saying everyone who is buying property must have a team. Now, if you are going to uh, transfer property, you'll have to have a team. And then of course, the moment you transfer, the question then becomes whether you withheld when you are paying for purpose of income tax. And then the question becomes, okay, by the way, you're buying land. How are, how are you financing that purchase? Do you have, are you in employment or in business? If you're in employment or you're in business, where is your tax return? Does it match your expenditure in, in purchasing the property? So that is one of the ways how they, they aim at trying to expand the tax base which is basically by what appear to be indirect subtle um, uh, regulatory uh, obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Begumia. Uh, do we have any further questions from the attendees? Yes, you can, uh, Mr. Yes, you can Mr. enable on this one. This is, I have, Mr. Onesmus, you can talk. Uh, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Hear. Oh, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to make a, a it's a good presentation. I have been listening uh, from the start. Uh, again, getting experiences from our sister EAC uh, community countries. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, one quick uh, comment. Uh, there is the issue of the compensation from insurance which now there will be a provision that it will be uh, the vatabo. But, but I think uh, the, the, the vatabo compensation, uh, which the act intended to capture is uh, a good example. If you, you lose stock, stock in trade, these are the goods you had bought. And unfortunately you didn't sell, they were lost. So what normally happens, you can claim a credit on that, but then uh, eventually, when you get the compensation from the insurance company, you will be now be required to account for the VAT. Otherwise it will be a loss uh, to the revenue uh, authority. If we allow you now, when you get the compensation, you don't charge that VAT because eventually once you get that, it means now the credit you have claimed should not be, be refunded or should not be payable to, to, uh, to KRI. Uh, maybe the other issue I would want uh, to mention or to, to just uh, uh, highlight is uh, the issue of the VAT. I think we have been having a discrepancy between the rates that are applicable in the three. If I, there are more countries that you can use the three countries, the Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And I know in the EAC protocol, there is that provision where the tax should be as equal as possible, the rates. That's why even we read the, 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 the budget are read the same day, uh, there is that move to harmonization. So in Kenya, we had taken our VAT rate at uh, 8% because there was a crisis, a serious crisis. It was an election uh, time and therefore going against the protocol. But now I think there is a provision to take it back to 16%. 16% is still, I think the lowest among our three sister countries. And I think uh, other than anything else, because there is also issue of loss of revenue, where the government have been losing a lot of revenue through, through those uh, subsidies, there is also the need now to have the harmonized uh, agreement uh, being obeyed or actually being taken into, into consideration. Uh, for the 3% uh, building, uh, uh, what we are calling the housing levy, I think the government, uh, the real intention where the housing is one of the outcome is we want to create uh, a fund. Uh, the government want to create a fund 
where we can be able to turn the country into a construction site. It is more or less of a patriotic uh, levy. And in between, you may get a house. And if you don't want to get one, you can get your refund. I think the only problem we have is the nitty gritty, how this will operate. Maybe the issue of uh, coming up with a regulation so that they are made clear how much you can get as interest if you are now getting back your contributions, the rank and all that. But the idea is good. Maybe what may be bad, it is when it is being introduced because I think everybody is complaining about the issue of high living cost. Uh, maybe they would have uh, said they pass it now, but maybe it will become applicable from you next year. Because I think the idea is great, the timing is wrong. Thank you. Onesmas, thank you for the extremely wise counsel and your very brilliant comments. Uh, any panelists that would want to comment further on this? The only comment I will give is let us agree to disagree on the housing fund. <laughs> we are not paying. We will be in court. We will be in court to challenge the same. So yeah, uh, is there any, get is there any other question from the attendees? No one has lifted their hand, so I, I want to assume they haven't, they don't have any questions. So if there is none, I think we can uh, close the meeting. It has been a pleasure to have you, panelists, Mr. Begumia, Mr. William, Mr. Osefu, and Mr. Obegi. Thank you for being part of this meeting and all the attendees who have actively participated, who have actively participated in our discussion today. We really appreciate for sparing time to be with us today. We, we are the East African uh, community, Young Lawyers Committee, com uh, committee. We'll, we promise to keep you in touch with our webinars just like this one to encourage you and to equip the young lawyers to get the necessary skills to grow their practice and also to expand their horizons. We also welcome ideas from all the members. Should you have uh, suggestions on, be on better ways for, you to serve, for us to serve you, please get in touch and we will forever be at your service. Uh, without much further ado, I will maybe welcome Mr. Gabriel Lasai to say some, or one word before we can close. Mr. Gabriel from the Secretariat. If Gabriel is not there, Brenna, you can say something. You tell us how, how we can actively participate in the activities of ELS because you are from the Secretariat. Brenna? Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, you can hear me. Thank you so much for attending the webinar today. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to have young lawyers that invested that are so passionate about what they do it's it's really great and um, as the chair and as we have group we keep updating you on our other activities we have a lot of activities coming on physical even virtual ones so we wish that we can stay in touch be as much as active as possible suggest we have a committee suggest what we think we can you know I don't know our agenda. We are here to serve you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you so thank you, Brenda. I realize that I have ambushed you. <laughs> but that was, but it's that was brilliant. It's a lovely part, but <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we thank you all once once more for your brilliant for your time. Thank you, the panelists, for your brilliant conversation, and we hope to meet again. And uh, thank you, and all of you. You can have a blessed 
afternoon. Thank you very much for hosting us, Mokua. We are grateful for the time all of you have taken to join us. Thank you. <coughs> I'll Thank be you. able to raise 20 million for deposits soon. <laughs> <laughs> We wish you the best, Mr. Mokura. <laughs>